Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I have a, a really interesting uh, set of guys, two guys here today. It's, uh, you know, I've always talked to either undercovers or the case agents. This time I have, we're going to talk about a case. It's uh, uh, Faded Star was the name of a case. It was a police corruption case down in Florida. And we've got the undercover who worked it. And we've got the case agent who worked this case. And and he's the guy that that then will debrief the undercover and kind of monitor and do all the background stuff and keep track of the the evidence and the files and and who's who and and it, it's really it, it's a lot of hard difficult tedious work many times and and while Jack's out having all the fun so we've got I know y'all know Jack Garcia welcome Jack hey how you doing Gary thank you for having me and we've got Richard Stout a uh, retired FBI agent Richard Richard welcome hey Gary thank you. All right. Well, Jack, is that right? Do you have to have all the fun while Richard has to stay in the office and do all the work? You know, that's the reputation on the covers have, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I know. Many right. times, you know, that's why I refuse sometimes to wear a transmitter <laughs> because as I'm ordering filet mignon and <laughs> shrimp and lobster tails, the agents outside are listening to this yeah. while they're sucking down peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> oh, so you're right. We do have fun sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, like I said, you guys all know Jack, or a lot of you do. Jack worked undercover on several different cases. I have him on on the show. On uh, it was about uh, taking down uh, Greg De Palma in the, in the Gambino family, if I remember right. And he's got a book out there. Uh, let me get the name of that. It's Making Jack Falcone an Undercover Agent Taking Down a Mafia Family. And I'll have links on that in the uh, show notes, you guys, if you want to get that book. It's a great book. But with Jack, Richard Stout, and Richard has recently retired, reasonably recently. He has Stout Security Consultants. Uh, Richard, you said you were going to be working on something. You've got a, you're contracted to work on something. What was that? Yeah, I'm working on uh, um, it, an investigation that happened in 2009. It was a five-year investigation, and it was uh, the largest criminal investigation in Miami Division. And it was about a fraudster. A Ponzi schemer by the name of Scott Rothstein. Okay. So uh, that project is in the works, and um, and um, you, you know you probably know learn more about it as as time goes on. Okay, I'll be watching for it and uh, be putting it on my uh, my Facebook page as you uh, uh, as I see some something coming out about it. that stuff. Usually has a way of working itself out there in the <laughs> Facebook and, and in the uh, popular media, and I'm always looking for that that kind of thing. We'll, we'll probably have you back and talk about that when you get that going. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, and, and Jack, what have you been up to since we talked last? Uh, just playing. No, you don't play golf. That's right. We talked about no, that. No, no, I don't. That Doing I don't public know. appearances and, and every uh, once in a while, podcast. yeah, I'm involved with a animal rescue group called the okay. guardians of rescue and, uh, kind of keep them busy that way. Strictly volunteer. And, uh, you know, in touch with old friends like Rich and uh, and you, Gary. Yeah. So I'm um, uh, I'm grateful to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right. You too, Rich, for bringing me on. Yeah, anytime, pal. It's great to have you guys here. So this is going to be it, it's Operation Faded Star, and, and it was a police corruption case down in Florida. Uh, and you know, Florida has is kind of a reputation, not maybe not as bad as Chicago or. Uh, uh, New York, but uh, Florida policemen, uh, if you remember the, the famous case where they hired Miami hired all these policemen and they're working drugs and, and they're raiding a drug kind of a warehouse and, and they're really just raiding it for themselves. And they made all the guys jump in the river and, and at least one or more of them drowned. It was a huge deal. And, and, you know, when you got cocaine and money flowing like they had down there in South Florida <clears throat> back in the day, you know, money corrupts. It, it just, you know, when you are got millions of dollars flowing around uh, and it's easy for a guy to take 50 grand and, and hand it off to somebody, you know, I never ran into that kind of thing in Kansas city, but boy, when you get close to the heart of that, that cocaine business and it's uh, there's a lot of temptation out there for, for guys that aren't making that much money. And so it happens, it happens. So Jack, you you were the undercover on this. How did you get started into this? Uh, Interesting story. I was working another case in Miami um, also with dirty cops. It was called the Hollywood police department. I think we snared like nine uh, police officers and 
during my course of working down there, I met Rich. He had a great reputation. He was a SWAT team uh, member and uh, a great case agent. And uh, I guess as the case was going on, he uh, and the case finished, he said, hey, I got some information regarding um, some uh, dirty officers in Broward Sheriff Department. So he asked me, would I be interested? But at that time, I had jumped to another uh, police corruption case up in Boston. Yeah. So it was kind of like Rich said, OK, well, why don't we use part of the group? Because there's a, a group of us that are undercovers, We're like a little fraternity and guys like. So uh, one of our mutual friends of Rich and I, uh, Joe Sincata, was working the case. And Joe, uh, he put Joe as the undercover and he began the operation. I was to come in that operation later on as the big Tony, the big T. <laughs> I was the big captain from New York to, to resolve that. Uh, this is a case that kind of Rich uh, ran by himself. I mean, it was uh, a lot of work to be done, not only in the consensual monitoring, uh, but also trying to get evidence. And as we'll tell you the story, even when as far as we had to get uh, airplanes to bring in uh, uh, dope, and uh, it, it really was uh, uh, a very detailed case. But I got involved with it at first in the background while Joe actually carried the case and uh, did an exceptional job. And then later on, it was time to bring me in to uh, try to bring in another character and try uh, another cop yeah. and others involved, and which is what I did. Interesting. So Richard, now what was what was your part? In it? When you open a case, if I remember right, uh, from my days on the PD and working with the agents, when you open a public corruption case, you have uh, some extra hoops to jump through because you don't want to be wrong on that. You don't want to go after somebody and not be able to do it. Right. The the FBI, Gary, they require predication for for uh, political figures, for public figures. So uh, you have to have some sort of uh, history or, or foreknowledge that they were involved in some sort of criminal activity. So just to set up the story, this was a joint case being worked by the Miami Field Division, the FBI, which is one of the larger field divisions in, in the Broward Sheriff's Office, which is the largest accredited sheriff's office in the United States. They have over 2,700 sworn employees. Um, so... And I'm not. Sh I'm sure that you know this, and you actually talked a little bit about it on the front end. But South Florida has historically been a retirement home for for all the organized crime families: yeah. the Gambinos, the, the the Genovese, the Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese. And from the beginning, all these families had extended their operations into South Florida, into the casinos, the dog tracks, uh, building contracts, strip clubs. Uh, Broward itself was was built in 1915. It was created when they emptied the Everglades. They wanted to create what they called useful land. And, uh, and, and, you know, with, with that background of it attracting organized criminals, uh, they, they had problems in the sheriff's office too. Um, Miami as well, but in particular uh, with, with uh, BSO. And uh, there was Sheriff Paul Bryan. He was uh, arrested for bootlegging in, I think, 1927. There was Walter Clark. He was arrested for illegal gambling. And most recently, Ken Jenny in 2007 for federal tax fraud. So uh, Broward has always been ripe for corruption. Mm. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> I didn't really realize that. That's, that's interesting. That, uh, and, you know, another thing is there's a lot of, of uh, relocated federal mob witnesses down there. I know a couple of three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they got tans. They're, they're in good shape. Yeah. yeah there's no state tax, Gary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just talked to a guy the other day that got relocated down there. He wasn't uh he was a really low level mob guy. He said, I just told him to send me somewhere warm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so Gary, the, the case itself was we're talking a little bit about predication. Uh, I inherited the case. Mm. And originally the case started as a spinoff off of a, a gun case. And um, there was a jailhouse snitch and he was reporting on our main character. His name is Richie Tauber. He goes by the name Wingnut. And uh, Wingnut had been, according to this jailhouse snitch, had been, uh, um, uh, you know, working the strip club and, uh, and uh, ripping 
you know, ripping some of the dealers. So the allegation was that he was keeping drug money. Just a little bit more background on Wingnut. He had he had been employed since 1994. He got hired in a smaller municipality that later got absorbed by the sheriff's office. And uh, he was from New York. Uh, he was a former Marine. He served in the Gulf. And uh, he had two lifelong friends of his, Chris Provenzano and Bobby Vicari. And they had been friends for over 30 years, dating back to the New York days. And they those two are going to play sign- significant roles later in the story. Yeah, these were all guys. These were all sheriff deputies down there. No, the, yeah. these two weren't deputies. These oh. were just friends of his. Okay. Uh, but lifelong friends uh, locked at the hip. And uh, they had been involved in some sort of criminal, you know, enterprising, I guess, growing up. Um, so Wingnut was fired from the sheriff's office and he was able to arbitrate and get his job back. And uh, and then there was a case that was open on a, a joint case between FBI and the sheriff's office. But the case um, had run for about a year. Uh, it wasn't getting much traction. And quite frankly, the case agent wasn't getting along with the detectives mm-hmm. and they weren't detectives weren't seeing that much work from the FBI. So they started going at it alone. So in 2006, Gary, two things happened. The agent working the case transferred off the public corruption squad and the BSO detective was transferred to another position. So it was a case of right place, right time. And then I was asked to take a look at it. I had a great relationship with two people at the sheriff's office, Tony Lanza and Mel Brim. Tony was uh, with their SID, their strategic investigations division. He was a sergeant. And then Mel Brim was this excellent detective. And, uh, you know, the SID was run by Kevin Butler, their captain. So all of these characters, phenomenal guys, guys that you could trust and guys that wanted to get uh, the job done. They were exceptional people. They're friends to this day. So so their SID was was pretty clean. It's kind of like our intelligence unit. They they really specifically bring guys in that they know their history and and they watch them pretty close. And and yeah, these these aren't like jump out squad guys. And I'm not, you know demurring them. They just, yeah, these, guys, yeah. th- these guys had many years of experience. Uh, they were seasoned. And uh, I think each one of them, by the time this case came along, probably had 20 years plus. Okay. So all three of us are together. We're, we're sort of starting the case all over again. We need to create a scenario to, to get, to get winged up, involved in us. And we well, were he, successful. He, he was, you thought he was ripping off dealers. Is that was that his main crime? Yeah, he he was just involved in all, he was involved in all sorts of shenanigans. Um, uh, he was uh, running around with prostitutes, I think, on duty, and there was a lot of things that were happening beforehand, um, and not all of it that I'm probably privy to right now. But uh, he was, let's just say, he was he was compromised. Okay. He had already been compromised, so um, and he had, was already sort of aware that uh, the agency, the, you know, the BSO, BSO had already fired him. So he was aware that he was potentially being followed around and it just made it harder. But nonetheless, we were able to set up a scenario and introduce him to a FBI cooperating witness. witness in turn introduced Wingnut to the first mm. undercover agent, to Joe. So then Joe starts, I mean, he, what's he introduced as? Uh, well, he's, he's betrayed. Who, he he's betrayed. As, he's betrayed. No, he's. Uh, Joe's Joe's a, a, an older white male of Italian uh, descent, and he's being portrayed as a member of the New York crime family. Oh. And he actually worked out of New York division at the time. Yeah. Rich, if I could add. Yes. If, if I could add about this, the first meeting that Joe had with Wingnut, he went on trying to impress uh, Joe. Uh, it seemed that he was fascinated <laughs> with, uh, with, you know, mob guys. So he went on to tell them things like, uh, you know, he has access to oxycodone if you need it. He starts talking about him and his friends uh, in New York that uh, one of his friends was doing, you know, pickups. Uh, so it was kind of like these guys were knock around and throw, uh, you know, sniffers of the mop. You could yeah. tell they've been around it. They know what it's like. They were from Yonkers, New York, which is next to, you know, the Bronx and all that. So they went on talking about, some of the things that he was capable of doing. They got into the story about steroids that they can get. So he's trying to push Joe into, hey, like me, Mr. Mob Guy. I'm really a nice guy and I want to work for you. Uh, cool. And Joe did a great job in, in having just 
throwing out the bait just a little yeah. and snaring them in. Uh, but yeah, he went on to listing that day everything that uh, w- that he could be a one stop guy uh, shopping I- if he's needed anywhere in uh, in Broward County. Wow. I'm sorry, Rich. Go ahead. You yeah, can- no, that's that's fine. And and um, at the very beginning, we wanted to make it clear to Wingnut that he had value to us because or value to to this organized group because of his badge. Yeah. And, um, and just one more thing. There's, there was a, there's a guy involved in this. His name is Hector Pascara. Now he was uh, retired from the FBI. He was uh, and working now. He's an executive manager at the, at the sheriff's office at the time. And as this case became more entangled with corrupt cops, Mr. Pascara had assured me that we had the full support of their agency. As the case, as you listen more to the case, you wonder why, why you know, BSO didn't shut it down when they had, because it was, frankly, the, these another cop's going to be introduced later, but uh, it just made their agency look really bad. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I've worked those cases here in the city, and and a lot of management do want to take it down quick. Because they just want to get it down quick and, and try to get them to quit. <laughs> that's that's the that's the yeah. ideal solution for police management is confront them and get them to quit and go on. <laughs> so so Wingna keeps meeting our guy Joe, knowing he's a member of a criminal organization. They need someone with a badge. We introduce an idea of transporting rare coins, the proceeds of a drug deal, up to uh, somewhere up to to New York. This is late uh, November 2007. And to carry these coins, you know, these coins were pretty heavy. So I went out and had to buy, um, you know, those Halliburton cases, those aluminum cases, and they got the mm-hmm. locks yeah. on the top. Well, interesting enough, uh, you could, that there's a rod in the back that holds the hinges together. You could just tap it out and the case will fly open. <laughs> but nonetheless, the suitcases for show, sure, uh, we, we put uh, the coins in them. Wingnut enlist uh, his friend Bobby, who um, who was a friend he grew up with. Uh, Bobby was a money collector and a drinker and a fighter. Uh, So he wants to bring Bobby along for this thing. He had also, Wingnut had planned for this trip to bring uh, police evidence receipts with the idea of maybe uh, before they leave that they put them, put the coins in a box and seal it with tape just in case. Like evidence. Just in case they're stopped. Yeah. Good idea. So. He heads out the door. This case probably weighs 80 pounds out the door and, and they jump in a car and they drive up 95. Wingnut tells the undercover that if he gets stopped, he's going to attend the cop, meaning he's going to present uh, his credentials if, yeah. he's, if he's stopped up there. And they were, in fact, stopped by an interdiction team in Maryland and released. Mm-hmm. But he, nonetheless, he was able to make the delivery. Uh, the, our, our first venue was Connecticut. And... Uh, and he was paid, I think, five thousand dollars for that, which he split with Bobby. Interesting. So you just, that would bring him in, and then you would then bring it eventually. I imagine you're going to tell him he's transporting dope. I would think would be the ideal thing. Is that where you're headed? Yeah. So exactly, that's where we're headed. But we, you know, we just want to see where where this guy will go. Um, and but it was twofold. It was to do that, but it was also to to have Joe make an introduction to uh, the capo. So in Connecticut, Wingnut was introduced to a capo named Big Tony. And Big Tony, <laughs> of course, was our friend Jack. Yeah. Um, and maybe Jack remembers that meeting better, but the substance was that we were telling Wingnut if he wanted to play, then he would have to earn. Uh, yeah, it was an interesting meeting. I mean, this guy couldn't stop like trying to impress us. <laughs> and by that, I mean is how he was able to tend the state trooper and how they were going to build these secret compartments next time to conceal the merchandise and how, you know, they were so wise about doing it that they are careful. They're always even passing advice to us as be careful with vehicles that are maybe dark out windows. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Gary, in law enforcement, a lot of guys (laughs) like those, but those stand out a mile away. Yeah, they so do. you know, so that's a, a a thing. Be careful with that drive. If you see a black uh, officer, I mean, a black man and a white man together, those are cops. <laughs> those are cops. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So he's like, he's trying to educate us how to avoid being arrested by the likes of him. 
That and blue jeans and blue jeans and pullover shirts. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So he he's over there trying to impress because he sees like, hey, this is a good way of making money, which is where we want him to be. Yeah. You know, and I think that was he was enamored with the casino. We went to Mohegan Sun. It was close to his old home in Yonkers, about two hours away. So he went to see his friends. He had money in his pocket. You know, he uh, he found uh, Shangri-La with us as far as making money. But at the same time, he's violating his oath. You know, he's committing (laughs) a crime here under, you know, the flag that he is a police officer transporting Krugerrands that are purported stolen from a a drug deal, uh, exchange for drug deal money, and he's ensuring the safe passage. Yeah. So we kind of felt good. We had them then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So we then, Rich says, okay, I think we're ready for a next step. You know, again, we have to play this calculated because it does have to be predicate. You can't, you, you can't entrap these individuals. Right, right. And you're bordering on it right now. This this yeah. first deal was this little, in, uh, a little romance here. It's bordering on setting up a deal. Well, that was a legal deal. You know, he just hadn't wanted me to transport this money up, you know. And, right. He could have got... Now, the key thing about entrapment, which is always something interest where always comes up, you know, if somebody's predisposed to commit a crime and we offer the opportunity to commit the crime, that's not an entrapment. It's only an entrapment when we plant the seed like, yes, take this money. Yeah. You've got to take this money or you're going to get a beaten. You're going to get this money or or else something. Now you're changing the mind of the individual to commit a crime. But we knew, having been rich, had him predicated. We knew he was he would do something like this. Yeah. This is in keep. So there was not there was already predisposition for him to commit the crime. Right, and if you didn't have it before, you definitely had it now. I mean, oh, that, exactly. all that talk. Well, exactly. Rich, did you try to get him to introduce you to other cops? Did you have a plan to see how many, how far this went? Yeah, the I mean that, that that was always the the idea in the beginning, and that's generally the idea in these police corruption cases is to see how many people are involved. Hmm. Um, but Jack just said an interesting thing. You know, talking about the predication. Well, one of the ideas that Wingnut floated at this meeting, he's telling. Tony, big Tony, he's telling Joe is he's floating this idea about security flaws at the airports mm-hmm. and maybe sending contraband through. Broward Sheriff's Office controls uh, Fort Lauderdale. They they have a um, they have an office there. And so and he had worked there for for several years. So he was quite intimate with how the security at the airport worked, at least there. Yeah. And he's offering to our undercovers that idea. And um, and and Bobby, who's not there at the time, he wasn't invited to this first meeting. We're also finding out that Bobby's trying to enlist a pilot friend into the group. Thinking about transporting dope, I would imagine uh, with that pilot was where he did you even bring up that about the cocaine. How did you like you had to go to the dope? I, I got a feeling. How to... Well, so so that but the next thing was this is that we we wanted to see if he would make a, make another run. So this time he flies up to Newark. He picks up what he believes are stolen diamonds. This time he brings another friend, Chris Provenzano. Um, he's not law enforcement, but just a friend of his. They were in a car. They drive back to Fort Lauderdale. We were able to introduce the third undercover, an FBI agent um, of Latin background who portrayed himself as being a, a member of a, a Colombian cartel. Yeah, and yeah. we're we're just planting these seeds yeah. for our story. Interesting. And then again, Tauber was paid seven thousand for that deal. So now it's January. Um, we sent him out for some debt collections. He's making a few hundred dollars doing that. He thinks it's a numbers game. He's picking up money for that. And at this point, uh, we believe Kevin Frankel's somehow involved. Now I haven't mentioned Kevin Frankel. Yeah. Frankel was a rookie deputy, and he had was introduced to the source early on by Wingnut. And the source didn't have a good vibe for him. And even Wingnut even says, yeah, uh, he tells the informant that he couldn't believe Frankel had passed the polygraph because he had been a drug dealer in New York. Mm. And we didn't know much about him. We knew he was 40 years old. He was a new hire and he used to have a restaurant up in New York. He was really a big guy, a roid guy, covered in tattoos. So we uh, we named him Tattoo. <laughs> so Jerry, our Colombian drug dealer, 
He has a few meetings to lay the foundation for a few future drug transportation. There are a lot of restaurant meetings, Coral Gables, Italian restaurants in Pompano Beach, South Beach, Connecticut, Newark, uh, Lago Mar, um, you know, places on the beach. And um, he's taking, Wingnut's taking Joe around and he's showing him all the airports in the area and discussing the flaws in each one of them. Uh, you know, the, uh, like um, uh, when the shift K-9 is going to be out, one of them had a flight school on one of the properties. So Wingnut thought it'd be a good idea to conduct the operation while school was in session. And, um, and meanwhile, Bobby's, you know, Bobby's having some interaction and he's on probation. And at the same time he's doing this, he's reporting to his PO. This wing that he's like this con- constant education in <laughs> from a police view and how to get by <clears throat> with smuggling and, and doing different things. He yeah. was a piece of work, man. Yeah, he, he was. was. <laughs> so, so um, now it's, it's early spring 08. Um, he gets his orders, come to Atlantic city, bring Provenzano and Bakari for formal introductions. They hadn't been introduced at this point uh, with big Tony and finalize the airport deal. Wingnut meets with our friend Joe, and then they meet Big Tony and another undercover. And uh, they they go to a restaurant for a drink uh, at the Borgata, actually. Yeah, now, <laughs> Wingnut comes armed to this meeting. He's wearing a, envision this, he's wearing a black dinner jacket, black pants, black dress shoes, and white socks. <laughs> and so from that point on, he catches the name Richie White Sox. And uh and he just caught hell from Bobby Bakari for for, for embarrassing him. <laughs> really? <laughs> so there's another meeting at Trump Taj Mahal. Uh Provenzano's formally introduced. They focus their intention on an airfield in Pompano, uh, which is a little bit north of Fort Lauderdale, has little or no security. And Wingnut's offering that he can monitor his police radio for calls to the airport and um, suggest that this deal be done during a shift change. You know, they, they take the diamonds, they, they head back to Florida. Did, did he offer any uh, uh, options for knowing anything about what the, the uh, local narcotics uh, Broward County narcotics people were up to, or have any connections to any task forces, have buddies that worked on a task force or something with the feds and the DEA down there in that area. Very limited, Gary. Um, Wingnut was a patrol officer, and he wasn't that in tune with okay. um, the, the the drug guys, the drug diversion guys, the SID guys. He just knew a little bit about them, um, but he really just wasn't in that circle. And maybe it's a circle of trust. I don't know. So we we introduced this idea of the, the drug deal. It's going to go in 08, uh, early 08. So Wingnut Provenzano, his friends Provenzano Bakari, they go down to Dade County and they meet all our undercovers. And the, the, the idea is they pick up some sham cocaine. Uh, we had surveillance teams up and out to document the deal, protect the UCs, and they meet uh, at, at a place in Doral. So they uh, meet with these guys, they bring them in a room and Jack's in there. Now, Jack has two suitcases open with 25 kilos each of sham, (laughs) and he turns them over to Wingnut's crew. Wingnut had brought walkie-talkies and instructed everyone to, like like, uh, Jack said, look look for surveillance teams, look for black SUVs. And he tells them, he goes, look for a black guy and a white guy together because they're probably detectives. (laughs) And um, and at some point, Provenzano during that meeting uh, hands a nine millimeter to Wingnut. Now, Here's where it gets interesting. At, at this same time, down in Dade County, this is happening in Dade County. Uh, our friend Tony Lanza, the BSO sergeant, is at the airport, and he's calling out a uh, suspicious police cruiser is roaming back and forth on the lot. So in Broward, they they have district cars, and those markings on those cars tell you what district they yeah. should be working. Well, this one was completely out of that district. In Doral, these guys uh, load up their drugs or load up the, uh, yeah, the, the, the coat, uh, wing, wing nuts doing an escort while Bobby and Chris are driving and they arrive at the airport as planned. They drive through an open gate. It's not monitored. And they wait at the edge of the tarmac and our undercover drives out to the plane. I'm in the plane with the pilot and I take the two bags. I then fly out with the pilot. Now they were thinking we're going to Teterboro. We actually did a circle around Broward and landed at another airport. 
Now, Gary, it, Rich, if I could just add yeah. to this. Now, Gary, think of it, the time that this happened, the snapshot of time, that was the time that was all over the news that terrorists were going to be utilizing small private planes. Yeah, oh, yeah. And landing. So when we were just talking about doing it at the airport, we assumed that we're going to meet some kind of, you know, frisk, a stop or something. Yeah, yeah. And I said, it's definitely going to happen. Rich thought it was, but we just drove right in. <laughs> drove right there in. wasn't <laughs> anybody there. We parked the car. Like I said, uh, Joe went to meet with Rich, who was uh, doing undercover work on the plane. The plane comes in. They take the, uh, uh, it transacted without one police or I could have had a barbecue there. So we came back and I go, this is unbelievable. What you we were hearing that everything, yeah. this was the, the number one priority. So I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to throw yeah, that in that because is interesting. It, yeah. it was shocking. <laughs> well, that, you know, that was one of the things that we wanted to see if we could expose to see if we could do it. And he, and he, and he did yeah. do it. Amid all the security that was supposed at that time, you know, just mm-hmm. you know, yeah. high security around airports and, and nothing. And he could do it too. So the, the surveillance teams out, they're watching this BSO patrol vehicle driving back and forth. We couldn't identify the driver. Now, this is what we didn't know at the time. Wingnut had been telling Kevin Frankel everything they had been doing and the money they had been making. And Frankel agrees to help Wingnut by running a counter surveillance for Wingnut at the, at the airport. Both of them had planned this out and they had surmised that if uh, this was a law enforcement operation, then the cops would probably approach Frankel's patrol car and tell him to get lost. Yeah, that's true. They were using drop phones. They were using pay phones. They had a code they were going to use. Um, if one of them said, I can't meet you at the gym today, that meant the deal is off. And so after this deal, uh, we pay him $10,000. And then uh, uh, we don't know this, but he goes and he meets Kevin Frankel. And Frankel's given his cut. And he, at that meeting, Frankel pats uh, Wingnut down to see if he's wearing a wire. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, so, hey, honor among thieves, right? Really? Jack, now, how was that mean? When you met these guys, you had those two uh, suitcases of cocaine. So how did you conduct yourself? I, I like your uh, a description of that. <laughs> Mr. Well, you know, it, it, well, I knew that they were enamored by us and, and, and really loved being around gangsters. So we were playing the role like, you know, normal. We really... We didn't show any fear. It was more like, hey, this is the dope. If this doesn't ap- show up, right. then you're dead. You know, that <laughs> kind. Of. So we we were kind of, kind of behaved. It's funny. You, I took the behavior that I learned as an undercover with the mob and you apply it to this mm-hmm. and you realize that, you know, it, 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 you don't have to say something, but your body language explains it. Like here's the yeah. here is the uh, the luggage comes in. It's expected they're going to do it or what? And they have passed the test before with the diamonds and the Krugerrands. So we were playing that role good. And the other thing is, since they did have a gun and they were there, you know, which keep in mind we're in a close setting yeah. at the location. I knew Rich was out there, and you know, Rich had my back. You know, yeah. so uh, it, it was. Uh, you feel like. It was a go. If it was kind of shady or sketchy, we would have definitely not done it at that location. Yeah. Interesting. You probably have a look, a practice look that you can give them a look. And they know. Right. I mean, when you're six, four, like 390 yeah. pounds, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the, let me say this too, though. Um, Jack, Joe, all those guys, they, they never, I never thought that they were uh, imposing themselves. Um, and I don't think they had to. And, uh, and, and and quite honestly, I don't know if that's helpful to the case to do that. Um, you know, what, what you're hearing now from Jack is pretty much how he talked to these people. Just, just you know, somebody who's a friendly guy, you just, uh, it, you know, somebody you just don't want to take advantage of. Yeah. Jack used to have a saying, I forget what that was. Um, don't, don't be miss. What, what was it used to say, Jack? Don't be, um, don't, I think you're talking about, like I always say, don't start off like a like a badass because you can't go down. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you will always be, you know, first impressions are important. And a lot of undercovers make that mistake. 
you got to stay in the character, the type of personality that you have, because you're going to have to sustain that. But I've seen guys who get into undercover, they come in like Mr. Badass. Whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. I said, take it easy. Just be <laughs> yourself. You know, if you need to kick it up, we'll kick it up. Yeah. But, you know, you don't, once you start as a jerk and once you start in that situation, you know, it, it's hard to come down. So that was always my motto. It was more like we worked, we were ourselves, we treated uh, the people, but at the same time, we gave the or because we had this image of us as being capitals and wise guys. Yeah. So because of that, they're not going to do that. They're not going to, they're going to, if anything, show respect and go overboard because they know we're paying them and it's an opportunity to earn. It was, um, don't mistake my niceness for weakness. Yeah. That, that's right. what we, something yes, that was it. I used that's to say, right. one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I did say that. So anyway, the, the deal is done. Uh, we suspect Frank will maybe involved, but we can't prove it. Uh, we try to put together another drug deal towards the end of May and hopefully bring out Frankel. Now, Frankel didn't mind being involved in this, this thing with Wingnut, but he refused to meet with anyone other than Wingnut. Mm. He didn't know Bobby. He didn't know Chris. And uh, I think he had learned this from New York when he was running the restauranting business and he was involved in, you know, drug trafficking then. Um, but he finally did agree to meet and he came out and he met with Joe on Las Olas. And his attitude was trust no one, which was stamped on his back. And I think I sent you a picture of that. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, keep in mind too, this was back in 08 and uh, Frankel is doing internet research, trying to identify the organization and trying to identify who the undercovers are. So this is towards the end of the case. Um, we're locking it down. We have evidence on three. Uh, we know there's another, but we can't prove it's Frankel. And the front office wants us to, to finish out this case. Oh, and for added measure too, Wingnut started ghosting us. He wasn't returning phone calls. Mm. So Bakari calls one of the undercovers, I think it was Joe, and tells him Wingnut is being looked at uh, by BSOIA for an excessive force complaint. And that he wants to lay low for a while. That wasn't true. The real reason was he knew he was over his head and he wanted out. Hmm. Nobody had leaked anything. Sounds like somebody maybe leaked a little something. Nobody had leaked. But um, I think collectively, uh, especially with Wingnut, and um, I, he just, I think he just started to get scared. Hmm. So we, we, we're gathering that he was, you know, for the fact that he really wasn't talking that much to um, our um, undercovers and he was giving limited information to our source. We just ended up grabbing wingnut towards the end of June and we don't have Franklin. So this is where Gary, great leadership comes into play. And you, and I know you're familiar with this and have talked about this with other people. Uh, and this is where I should mention my boss, Mario Tarici. If you've ever seen the Cocaine Cowboys on Netflix, mm -hmm. Mario Turici was the FBI agent, excellent agent, always supportive as a boss, always had good suggestions, always served as a buffer between me and the front office. It was Mario's idea to grab Wingnut to, to bring him to a hotel and get him to cooperate. So we did just that. We picked him up off the street. He got into a van. The agents and uh, detectives, they identify themselves. They didn't say anything. They just showed him a videotape of all the stuff he had done. And they just drove. And he was stewing on that. So he gets to the hotel. Mario and I meet with him. And he agrees to completely cooperate. He's in 200%. He corroborates everything we already knew. But he also adds the part of how Kevin Frankel had also been in on it. But now we have a problem. Wingnut had been gone for a few days and hadn't been in contact with Frankel. So we had to come up with a story that would cause Frankel to, to meet with Wingnut and have a conversation about a deal. Yeah. And we also knew that Frankel was super surveillance conscious and would pat him down if they agreed, you know, to meet. And uh, also they had, before even this the drug deal had happened, they concocted a scheme to never discuss it. And if they did, the other would know that yeah. he was wearing a wire. That was smart. <laughs> yeah. So all of this was a problem, <laughs> all a problem to overcome. Really? And, over the course of a few days, we come up with a story to cover cover Wingnut being gone for two or three days. We put Wingnut back on the street. We gave him his badge. 
Uh, I had a friend of mine, Hilton Yam, an agent. Uh, he's also a gunsmith. He disables Wingnut's gun, his service weapon, in a way that can't be easily detected. So we give him back his badge and his gun. And uh, we sent him up to meet Frankel. And Frankel pats him down. He misses the recording device. And uh, but Wingnut's story was that he needed to make money. And, you know, he's aware that they agreed never to discuss it, but he wants to do another load. <clears throat> and Frankel wants a bigger cut. So we arrange another deal with just Wingnut and Frankel in this one. And uh, and that's when we arrested Frankel. So at the end, we we end up arresting four people out of this operation. Wow. So he couldn't, there, there was no really other like network of, it was just mainly this Frankel dude and, and uh, um, wing that that were, were dirty. Well, that's, that's where, um, again, wing that both of them gave up people within the sheriff's office. So that's what I was uh, thinking. Weren't, weren't part of that organization, but a funny thing happened in SID. Uh, they had transferred Kevin Butler out. Uh, the captain, stand-up guy, and replaced him with a guy who, um, whose excuse that I was told was that how are we going to believe this guy wingnut? And uh, they just they ceased to cooperate with us yeah. with the FBI. So this case was was done, uh, you know, at the end of this arrest. And Gary, as you probably know, is that working police corruption cases are the most difficult ones <clears> to work. <throat> Oh, I yeah. mean, really you're hard. really are what you have is a police officer who took an oath and now it's breaking that oath and it's committing criminal acts. So for that, our job is to find out to go up the ladder and see what other police officers are involved. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes more difficult for us because they're certainly not going to go and recruit a guy that they feel that they could do something wrong to go to this level. Yeah. So it's always very kind of self-contained and because they don't want people, the other officers to know that he's dirty. So they kind of operate in the shadows. Yeah. Uh, so, but our job is always to try to go as high as you can. And then of course uh, the case ends and some places you have success. I mean, uh, well, Hollywood, we had, I think nine Boston, it's like 12. Yeah. It, it just, it just keeps going until you can't go anymore. Here, the problem was Wingnut was excited, but the other guy, the, the, the steroid guy, he was so overly cautious mm -hmm. and paranoid, probably because of the steroids that he was taking. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know Ray Morrow in, uh, in Cleveland. I interviewed him and, and he, those guys, those Cleveland coppers, they were recruiting their buddies and coming in yeah. and guarding this gambling game. And, and they'd recruit more people. And then those guys all left. He recruited a whole new crew of people. It was like, man, that department was, at that time was uh, it was just rife with corruption. Man. G Gary, we had the case in Hollywood, Florida, where we had the whole Hollywood Police Department SWAT team oh, really? guard a tracked the trailer that <laughs> yeah. had stolen items for me. And all their response was, or at least the dirty cop that I was dealing with was, listen, just don't tell them what's in the truck. They don't want to know. They're not going to ask you <laughs> yeah. for anything. So there you go. So a lot yeah. of, you know, it's that, uh, uh, you know, denial. Don't ask, don't, ask don't tell. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That denial. When it, you throw that money out there and say, well, I didn't know. <laughs> Right, exactly. Oh, I didn't know the bag contained dope. It was just a bag. Yeah. I mean, how so, ridiculous, you know. So, so Gary, you asked me this question in the beginning about um, a case agent versus, you know, an undercover guy. Yeah. And so um, I got to tell you that what was what's tough about being a case agent is the operational tempo. And this thing was going, it was thing after thing after thing. Meanwhile, you're planning scenarios, you're, you're surveilling the meetings, you're downloading recordings. There were over 70 recordings to this, to this case. It was, mm -hmm. it was a 10 month case. You're entering records, writing reports. I remember finishing an operation late one night in Miami. I went to the office, I entered the evidence, I went home, I packed my bags, and then I flew up to New York to book in the operation later that afternoon. <laughs> 
And so then you're also keeping up with the financials, which, which is yeah. a big thing. Yeah. I had to financially manage the investigation, rent cars, pay for hotels, flights, keep a record of the payments and be <laughs> able to justify it. Yeah. And then there's report writing, U.S. attorneys. I was never home. <laughs> oh, and keep in mind, too, that all this is going on. Jack is in the process of releasing his book and he's he's going to go public. <laughs> So you got to get it done fast. Now, well, Jack, Rick, Jack, did you have to keep, you have, how'd you do your money? Did they just, do you have to keep track of your own money? Well, buying? what happened is uh, whenever I did the undercover, keep in mind, Gary, I had retired and I was working on the contract oh, by I the didn't FBI okay. in the end of the Hollywood case, in Rich's case, and in Boston case. Yeah. So I, I had contracts, so Rich made it work for me. So I would be kind of like a source, yeah. you know, I, I would come in, Rich would give me whatever monies I needed, whatever tools I needed to get the job done. Rich was excellent at that. A lot of case agents don't do that. I mean, when you came in, you were ready to go. You had, you know, he gave you whatever you needed, never, uh, you know, when without. So yeah. I would keep all my stuff at the end, just give them the whatever receipts I had to and do a communication. But in my case, I would just relay to Rich as I hand them over the recording devices, what occurred. So besides all of that work that Rich had to do that he just told us about, he had to, had to do also my 302, my paperwork. <laughs> oh, so, <boy. laughs> you know, oh, yeah, it's a tough job to work a case uh, uh, as a case agent. And uh, unless you've been there, you, you really appreciate it. On the covers, we kind of go in. We're like the actors. You yeah. know, uh, we just walk in and do our thing and yeah. then walk away. Well, that's when Rich's day He's really the begins. Producer, director, isn't he? Yes, the editor, the, the producer, editor. You, name it. you name it. And bring on the talent. Okay, it's, talent's it's off. All, that's it's all true. Work. Exactly. It's all true. I knew that. A lot of people don't really understand how much work goes on behind the scenes of a big operation like that. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like, uh, those 70 tapes, they all had to be true. You got to get somebody to transcribe them and then make copies. Somebody make copies of that and then put those in the case file. And then you got to know what's in them and yeah. you got to read all that. So if you got to go back to refer to, you know, snippets from that and. You know, it's, yeah, and then deal with the United States attorney's office yeah. as well. So you're right. There's just a lot of work that goes on in, in work and in, in investigation. That's why I guess throughout my career, I chose to be an undercover. undercover. So I didn't have to deal with that nonsense. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I did have help. I had a guy named Martin Ruiz de Gamboa, who was a friend of mine agent. And, uh, and uh, cause it, it's certainly, it, it's not in, in both of you have tested this. It's not a one man operation. Yeah. One man can't do one man can't conduct, conduct these complex operations. That's for it's, sure. It, takes, it just takes a lot of people and there's got to be uh, some political will to it. Yeah. Really. And, and yeah. Gary, as you know, too, when you're doing an undercover in the street among wise guys and among criminals, you want something you pretty much will get it that same day. Yeah. You know, a guy who knows a guy, you know, a guy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if to do it within the FBI or in law enforcement is, OK, fill this 10 pages out. Write this report. This guy, write <laughs> this report. The chain of command. <laughs> exactly. Get this guy to sign it and that guy yeah. to sign it and that guy. So by the time it gets all around and passed, you're like, it's over. You know, it, <laughs> yeah. so that to me is the frustrating part about it. When you're on the street as an undercover and then as a case agent, you really work to try to get it done and you understand that it needs to be done, but then you get into the uh, the, the layers yeah. that sometimes are there to obstruct, not to help. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. This has been a great story. I mean, it's, uh, I really like this kind of behind the scenes look that people don't, they, they, people out there like seem to like to listen to mobsters tell stories, but there's so much more to it and, and how complex it is. And, and right. to me, that's just as interesting as, as anything else. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It was it was fun. I'd never do it again, but it was fun. <laughs> now, Richard, what were you on the SWAT team during this time? Did you just have to uh, bail out or did, did you yeah, get I, I, once um, in a while? I, I didn't bail out, but that was around the time I'd already I'd already been on the team for about 10 years. And um, 
and between that and, and you know the SWAT travel and the family, just too hard to juggle. Yeah. So I, I didn't entirely give up the SWAT, but I uh, I just sort of minimized my activity. Yeah, because there's training too. I don't know. I was had a SWAT team as sergeant for two years, and yeah. and we you know we'd have take a whole day every month uh, just to do operations or practice operations. We would take another day just to shoot. So uh, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Treatment. Gary, if I could say something, um, is that Rich talked about a very dear friend of his and mine, um, the UCA number three, uh, playing the role of the Latin drug dealer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, his name was Jerry Bermudez. May he rest in peace. He's probably one of the best undercover agents I've dealt with on many cases that I did, a lot of narcotic cases. With Jerry, he uh, uh, he was a gentleman, a true professional, and uh, just want to say may he rest in peace. Yeah. Thanks. Well said. Well said. He was a good man. A very good man. Okay. You got anything? Anybody got anything else? A burning <laughs> desire to say anything else about this? Huh? It's been a no, good man. Story. We've we've kept you too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a good story. I like a good story. <laughs> All right, Gary. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> All okay. right, guys. Take Talk care. Talk to you. Right, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, folks, that ends a, another Gangland Wire episode. I uh, really uh, appreciate you tuning in and listening, however you listen to it, whether it's on the website or on one of the apps. I, I also want to express my thanks and sincere appreciation for the kind reviews that you've given me uh, on the app, or the Apple app or, or some of the other podcast apps. I don't check them. I used to check them when I first did this. I checked them a lot, but I don't check them anymore so much. Once in a while, I look at them. Uh, sometimes I get, you know, sometimes I get my feelings hurt, especially on YouTube, but that's okay. Uh, if you put yourself out there, you, you better not have a thin skin. I've learned that. Uh, you know, my most recent documentary, I really want to express uh, uh, extra appreciation to the people that stepped up and helped me finance that movie and, and able to increase the production values, uh, hired a professional to do the reenactment scenes and some of the other things and, and got some better music I had to pay for. And we have it out now. Now, the last time I did one of these endings for the uh, uh, podcast, I, I had a different title. I changed the title just at the last minute. It's now about theft, burglary, murder, and cover up. So I encourage you to come on the website. I can't get it on Amazon like I have Brothers Against Brothers and Gangland Wire because they changed their rules. And if I can't get a theatrical release like a major film studio or get it in a major film festival, which is kind of like, uh, um, uh, I don't know what it's like. It's, it's, it's dang near impossible unless you're politically connected to some of the people that run these film festivals. And a guy like me uh, doesn't really have a chance. It's been my experience. I fought that a few years back and, and I gave up. It's, it's too much effort for uh, too little payoff. Uh, but if you want to stream it, it's on my website for $1.99. I figured out a way to do that. And uh, you, you, you pay me $1.99 and I will send you a link to stream it. As well as my other two movies, you want to stream them for $1.99. Of course, I have the DVDs for sale. Or if you make a donation, why uh, I'll give you the DVD and give you a streaming uh, link too. Or a book or Kindle book, whatever you want. You, know, you guys kind of know the drill by now if you've been listening to it. If not, just go to my donate page. I uh, uh, One last thing, I've kind of uh, dogged off on this PTSD thing. I used to always uh, uh, want to try to promote that. So uh, if you've been listening to podcasts, you know what to do. But uh, if you have any problems with PTSD and you know and you're a veteran, then you know go to the VA. If not, go to the VA website. Or just Google VA hospital PTSD, and they've got a hotline, and they've got a lot of resources. And even if you're not a veteran, or if you just know a veteran, you can you can go there and find the resources. If you're not a veteran, you can go there and find resources. So I appreciate all your support over the years, and uh, we'll see you again next week, or listen to you next week, or you'll listen to me 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 next week.